Um, so we're talking uh, wood lice, uh, as you well know, and uh, there are two parts to this talk. Um, this evening is is really just an introduction. It, it's a fairly um, light-hearted and uh, sort of generic introduction to what are wood lice, what people think about wood lice, um, some of their basic anatomy and the ecology and, and lifestyle of, of wood lice. Um, if you're particularly interested in identification of British species, um, that will be on the next session next week on the 1st of April, um, April Fool's Day, um, but actually as, as far as I can tell, everything I'm going to tell you next week is relatively sensible and it's after 12 noon anyway, so I don't believe in, in tricking people after 12 noon on the 1st of April anyway. So um, tonight it's uh, just this general introduction and hopefully if I can get us underway, there we go. Um, some of you will have um, seen me before uh, presenting these talks, um, but for those of you who haven't, that's just briefly who I am, so you know if I have any kind of credentials whatsoever for speaking to you this evening. The key thing is that uh, bottom left, that centipedes, millipedes and woodlouse uh, CD, uh, which um, is what I'm basing my talk on this evening. Um, so I'm a member of the British Myriapod and Isopod group. Uh, isopods are the wood lice. Um, and so uh, the, this introductory guide covers centipedes, millipedes and wood lice. And this is the third talk. So we'll have completed it by the end of this evening. So that's who I am. And uh, as I say, this evening, um, basic introduction, what is a wood louse? What is the life history generally? A bit about taxonomy, general morphology of the creatures, how to collect them, maybe how to record them, and certainly in Britain anyway, and uh, one or two uh, identification characteristics as we go through that you'll pick up. And there will be time for some questions at the end. Um, as Liana said, if you want to add, drop any questions into the chat, then um, we can pick up on those uh, towards the end. Um, hopefully, whoops, excuse me, right, next week, much more uh, digging into the specifics of a selection of British species, quite about a, a good half of the British species at, at least. So as I say, um, this is the CD um, that uh, it's all on there and in electronic form. Um, this was designed as a standalone talk, so you can uh, I can present it to people, um, uh, to a group of people, um, or you can sit and just work your way through it um, on your own computer. Uh, the last two talks were using it specifically. Um, today, with the wood lice, I've expanded it a little bit, so I'm not actually directly using uh, the CD. So if you are familiar with the CD, if you've, if you've actually got um, a copy of that, um, then that we, you, you may recognize some changes, but anyway. Um, if you missed the first two talks on millipedes and centipedes, as Liana said on the YouTube channel for the Tinnipter Project, um, they're, they're there now. Um, so millipedes and centipedes, um, get yourself comfortable because they're, they're quite long, but lots of information and you can, you can pause me. Um, the joy of these events is that what, what, what I like to do is I'll show you a lot of the information if I'm speaking too quickly when it comes up on YouTube at a later date you've got that opportunity to stop me in my tracks rewind me and listen again you lucky people um, at the pre for the previous two events um, I directed people to Nature Bureau to buy a copy of the CD um, since that time uh, they're, they're no longer available. We've actually, um, the only copies now are with uh, the British Myriapod and Isopod group, um, but it's now also cheaper to obtain it. So sorry for those of you who paid more, but it is now available directly through BMIG. Um, seven pound, if we could meet in person, I could sell you a copy for five pounds, but um, sadly that is not um, possible in the current state of the world. But we will meet again, folks, we will. 
Um, so <clears throat> beyond the CD, um, which as I say, just gives you the opportunity to look at everything at your leisure, um, there is a lot of information which is available to all of you right now online. Um, the key site is the British Myriapod and Isopod Group's um, website, which is basically bmig.org.uk. That has all the information on um, all of those groups and will allow you to um, look through the different species, different recording um, issues. There's a lot of resources for identification um, and you can find most of what you want to know, hopefully, um, on that website. And the information on how to obtain the CD is there too. This is the page that you'll get to if you're if you follow the species uh, recording and go through um, to the woodlife section. And if you were to click on any one of the species names, that will then take you to something like this, which will show you the uh, a bit of species information, um, how, roughly how to identify it, some pictures in a gallery, which is very useful. And um, there are maps you can click on and that, they'll take you to things like the NBN maps and, and other references. So bmig.org.uk um, will be the place to go after, um, after this talk if you need more information. The other really good place is um, do join um, the Facebook group for the isopods and myriapods of Britain and Ireland. Um, there's quite an active community there. It's also the place where the anything sort of hot off the presses, all the news happens. So um, anybody sees something uh, uh, different or unusual, it gets posted on there. I found a new uh, millipede to Yorkshire this week, so I posted that on there. So. It's, it's the most up to date place. And if you've got queries, you want to post pictures of things for identification. Again, excellent site um, and lots of people with a lot of expertise are there to help. So we're a very friendly community of people. So do get involved in that. You don't have to do anything else on Facebook if you don't want. But if you do anything, do this one. So I'd like to start off with, you know, everything everybody knows about woodlice. Uh, the things that people say, oh, woodlice are eating my home, woodlice are such a pest, oh, I hate all lice, including the woodlice, or oh, the one I probably hear more often than not is, oh, yeah, woodlouse is just a woodlouse, isn't it? You know, woodlouse is a woodlouse, it's a woodlouse. Um, the thing that I often get is people, if they know that I'm interested in woodlice, they'll say, oh, woodlice, oh, oh I, I, could I can give you some woodlice. Yeah, I'm not just after any woodlice, just all woodlice, you know, I'm interested in uh, identifying the species and recording them rather than just taking every woodlouse that everyone has walking across their carpet. Um, so those are the sort of general um, expressions that we hear perhaps a lot. So to just get that out of the way, woodlice don't feed on good wood. They're not eating your furniture unless your furniture is already rotting. Um, if you've got a large accumulation of woodlice in the home, maybe that's a good indicator that your house is too damp or you've got an area where something's rotting that has attracted them and enabled them to reproduce and, and multiply. Um, so if there's perhaps fungi or, 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 or rotting timber somewhere um, or just some damp areas, then you may accumulate woodlice. Um, if you get rid of those damp areas, then you'll get rid of your woodlice. They don't really want to be there particularly. Um, and if they if they do persist, then they want to get out. So do help them out. They don't like dry, warm, centrally heated homes. They want it to be damp and cool. Um, so then they're, they're in unintentional guests in your home and uh, they'll be very happy for you to pick them up. They're a very robust creature. Most of the ones that you'll find trotting around can be picked up very easily and just taken outside. Um, and they will just dry up and de uh, desiccate and die if you leave them in the house. Um, people often say, well, you know, I, I do keep getting them. And then I would suggest that perhaps you look around the house. Are there, are there piles of wood? Are there plants right up against your house, right by the door? Um, is, is, is the seal underneath your door? Uh, suitable to, to keep them out, because um, if it rains and you get moisture going under your front door, then 
the wood louse doesn't know where it's going. It'll just follow a damp area and end up inside and find their way out. So they don't want to be in your home. Um, they're crustaceans, which perhaps comes across as a, a surprise to some people. Um, so they're basically a little land lobster, um, a sort of uh, house shrimp, if you like. Um, they don't they don't cause any harm. They don't really bite. You have to go a long way to feel pain from a bite of a woodlouse. Um, they don't carry any um, humanly transmissible diseases. They don't even eat your food. They're not even after the stuff that you eat in your house. So they're not going into your cupboards to finish off your crackers and, and loaf of bread particularly. But if they're stuck in there and there's a damp loaf of bread, I expect they will if it's, uh, that's what's there. Um, they're actually a really beneficial thing. Woodlice are a tremendously useful creature. Um, they're a great recycler of nutrients. They break down um, all sorts of plant material and also some animal material and, and recycle. Um, so they're, they're excellent in your compost heap um, and they'll, they'll get rid of molds. And you may have noticed those of you who've got pets um, that leave um, little gifts on the lawn for you that the woodlice may well start to clear that up along with the slugs as well. So they have, um, um, they have good uses. Um, there are in, in Britain, there are around 60 different species of woodlouse, and that includes those that are found in uh, tropical uh, heated greenhouses as well. So perhaps more like 40 out in the wild, um, but we'll look at that uh, in detail shortly. So there we are. Woodlice are good things, nothing wrong with them. We should all love them. Um, so this is what you would get if you start the CD-ROM. Um, it starts out with a lot of this information that's on the CD. So as we go through it, and um, if, say, if you want to pause it when it's on YouTube, that's great, or by the CD, I think we do the same. Why on earth would we look at woodlice then, apart from all those good things that I've just told you? Well, there aren't too many to learn. Again, I'm referring to the British situation, or I think someone from the Orkneys was, was on earlier saying, I think they've got seven species. So it's not a huge task. You're not trying to learn all of, all, all of the plants or you know, large numbers of, of parasitic hymenoptera or whatever. There aren't that many, so it's a good small number to get to grips with. They're very easy to find. You know, everyone has woodlice somewhere near them. Um, if this if the statement's ever true about you're never more than a meter away from a rat or something, I suspect it's so you're much closer to a woodlouse. Um, they are fascinating. They're really lovely creatures. I know some people find them a little bit uh, uh, spooky and are not very keen, and certainly perhaps would not pick them up. But um, I they're a nice, clean, dry, um, lovely little animal, and they have some very interesting behaviour. Um, they're a very good introduction if you've not really looked at invertebrate natural history before. Um, so a lot of the things that we learn about woodlice are uh, it's sort of transmissible skills to for, for transferable skills to, to other um, subjects. So uh, a good thing to perhaps get young people interested in, uh, school kids, uh, or just someone who you're trying to get interested in uh, in natural history. They're a, they're a good little group. They're very easy to collect, and so you can just pick them up. And quite a lot of them are relatively easy to identify as well, um, as we'll see. And so there's about 40 or so um, outdoors in Britain that we know of. Um, and half of those are pretty widespread and generally ubiquitous and, and found in, in most places. Um, so you can find them and you can uh, tackle the identification of these things um, if you want to give it a go. And of course, they're around all times of year. So you're not waiting for the sunshine as you would with a dragonfly or a butterfly. Um, you, you don't get an off season particularly. Uh, and they, they're, they're adult, um, there are adults around all the time. So, so there's lots to lots of good reasons to look at them. Another particularly good uh, reason in Britain to look is there's a lot of good information out there. Um, I shall be waving one book or another around at various points, but there's some excellent guides, um, about sort of the classic guide in, in Britain. You can, um, I'll look at these in more detail. Obviously the, the one by Richards is excellent. Um, Keys, Edgar Keys, 
kids' books, atlases, and even sort of simplified identification charts. So no excuse really. And a lot of natural history, uh, popular subjects, it's not so much what the creature's like, it's what the resources are like, and uh, there are good resources. But more than, um, you know, you're not just identifying stuff that's same old, same old. The wood lice in Britain, there's a lot of new discoveries being made all the time. And anyone who, who follows the Facebook group will see people are finding them new county records, uh, new country records, you know, new variations, new colour versions and, and new species. Uh, so um, there's always a, there's that motivation to be finding something new potentially. So uh, excellent group to look at. And the BMIG are very active in recording them and always reviewing um, the sort of situation of the distributions of these things and, and want to encourage more, uh, more people to look at them. So when it's great me doing these talks, it's great you're learning about wood lice, um, but, you know, go out and record some, you know, whichever country you're in, wherever you are, someone out there would like to know what species are out there. So, so do go and... Uh, take this on and actually record some stuff. So uh, the other key element of this is from an ecological point of view, from the natural history aspect, they're a very uh, significant decomposer, as I mentioned, but they're also um, a very significant food source. I, I always say this, that, you know, if you're a wood louse and someone said, oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a food source. It's not the best career in the world, admittedly. But um, the, 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 the truth is there that these, these are a very um, frequently eaten prey, so a prey item by a lot of different uh, other groups. So quite, a, quite an important thing just by the fact that other things are eating them, unfortunately. Um, and of course, they make interesting pets. Um, you know, if, if you've got a, um, I've got a pet wood louse, they're not all quite as big and very and, and soft as this one, but um, they're easy, very easy to keep. And there are a lot of um, interesting observations you can make and investigations with wood lice. They're very good as a sort of school um, and undergraduate project. There's a lot of sort of ecological um, um, techniques and skills that can be uh, applied to wood lice because they're very, very easy to keep. But more on that later and my friend here. Um, this, this is a lovely, it's actually a marine isopod, but it's, it, it does the job. It's got the right number of legs anyway. So, next. The theory of wood lice is, um, whatever people call them, and we'll, we've had a few names come up earlier um, that people wrote in, um, they're a very familiar animal. Um, most people understand, they might not call it a woodlouse, they might call it a slate or a roly-poly or a pill bug. Um, but wherever you are in Britain, they've probably got their own unique little name, um, which goes to show that you know, they're, they're such a familiar creature that they've developed um, their own local identity. So whether you're calling them a gramazow or a roly-poly or, or a cheesy bug, or a granny gray or a granny grandpa, as I've, I've heard them termed as well. Uh, cheese logs, chuggy pigs. We, we saw a few on the, um, on the chat earlier. That, just the fact that there are so many names for them really is an indication of, of the familiarity of this animal. Um, not the, so much the same with when we were talking millipedes, you know, people kind of vaguely know millipedes, something that has lots of legs, but people really do know what what you're talking about when you're talking about a woodlouse, certainly if you translate it into their local dialect. <clears throat> the other thing with woodlice that I want to look at this evening, which is just um, relatively entertaining, there are a lot of cultural references to, to woodlice. So they, it's not just a natural history and science context that we, we encounter woodlice. Um, they're <clears throat> There's a, there's a classic paper by Arthur Chater, which you can find reference to on, uh, on the BMIG website in, in Isopoda 2, which is the, the bulletin that, that we used to produce just on woodlice. 
and um, it's it's about the cultural uh, woodlife and the cultural consciousness of Europe, and so it just looks at all sorts of different ways where woodlice have, have got absorbed into um, into sort of human existence. And I'm, I'm going to go through quite a few of those and brought it up to date a little bit um, for you this evening um, to see you may recognise some of these connections and equally some of them may surprise you as to where woodlice um, crop up, but they are everywhere. Um, so there's some woodlice. I'm not sure if that's actually the first bunch of woodlice we've, we've seen, um, but quite common and very familiar. But they they are seen in, they're seen as food. Um, people eat woodlice. Um, they're seen as medicine in some cultures as well. So they've, they've got certain um, medical properties. They're seen in advertisements, they're seen in literature. I've got a number of examples of, of where they're in music, uh, poetry, um, they crop up in nostalgia and evoking atmosphere as similes, as a sign, as a harbinger of doom, even, you can find reference. They're in political satire, and they're even used as a metaphor for helplessness or insignificance, and even moral contemptibility. So um, woodlice are, they're out there in the consciousness of, of, of society. So let's have a look at where they crop up. Um, so they're in poetry, as I mentioned. Um, John Betjeman, um, former poet laureate, and uh, he refers to the sea woodlice, uh, where black and flat sea woodlice crawl and isolated rock pools wait, washed from the highest tides of all. And so there they are in poetry. Um, and in art, I can't show you the picture, unfortunately, for, for copyright reasons, um, but if, if you're familiar with any of Paul Clay's work, so um, fine artist, Paul Clay, um, and Hassel and Asselim Gehege are images of woodlice. They look like fish bones, and he does do some other fish-related um, uh, uh, paintings, and they're like fish bones, but they are in actual fact. Um, the name Assel, um, the German name, um, also, you, you recognize the name Acellus, as in Acellus aquaticus and Aniscus Acellus in Woodlouse scientific names. Um, so they're definitely woodlice that he's referring to. And if you want to see these pictures, the, the link, there's a link there which will send you to them. Um, mm. But in a, in a more contemporary uh, setting, um, this, this is a piece called Orbiting Woodlice by uh, Chris Dunseith. And, it, it's basically a, a sculpture made of uh, paper and wood lice and, and carved um, wood. But uh, he, he used quite a lot of his, his art is about um, interpreting uh, quantum physics and a lot of scientific principles. And, and in this one, I, I understand that the, the fact that wood lice are there one minute and then they're not in his studio, they're around and about. Um, and, a little bit like some of the concepts that he was studying in terms of quantum physics, things disappearing without apparent reason. And um, um, he has given permission for me to use this, this image and assures me that no woodlice were harmed during the making of this sculpture. And they, they were all dead specimens that were lying around in the studio and elsewhere before being incorporated actually into the work of art. Um, but there we are, woodlice as art. And, and thank you, Chris, for permission to use that. Um, I mentioned food in recipes. Um, there's a 1980, uh, an 1885 woodlouse sauce, which is uh, described. Uh, uh, and in La Russe Gastronomique, um, there's, there's this woodlouse sauce. And uh, it's apparently very nice with fried sole, but if you bear in mind that this is basically this is crustacean, this is basically a land lobster, this is, this is the shrimp in your house, it's basically a shrimp sauce um, that goes very well with fried sole apparently. Um, but beware how often you eat it, as we will see in a moment when we get onto medicinal properties. Um, but before we get there, there's, there's a spiritual angle, and this is a, this is a beautiful 
um, example of a woodlouse in stained glass in St Mary's Church in Shrewsbury. And it's, uh, it's interesting, it's definitely a woodlouse. It's got the right number of legs, it's got seven pairs of, of legs and two antennae and a pair of eyes and those bumps across the back. And, and the, the Latin at the back, uh, it's, it says uh, cancro um, or cancer, which relates to uh, cancer, the crab and crustacean. So whoever made this stained glass um, wasn't thinking it was an insect. They were well aware that it was a crab, land crab and a crustacean, which, um, which is quite fascinating, really. It's not this, very often people refer to them as insects, but clearly this is, this is listed there as, as a crustacean in a stained glass window in a church. There's another classic, um, which I think in, the, um, in, in Arthur Chater's paper, I think you find the reference. Um, there's a sermon from the Chancellor of Truro Cathedral many years ago that actually relates woodlice to the Trinity. Um, we don't have time for me to um, expand on that this evening, um, you'll be pleased to hear, um, but it apparently, it, it, well, from when I read it, it, it has something to do with nutrient gases and digestion, and anyway, it's um, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Woodlouse, it's all there together somewhere. Um, further in, into literature, um, a whole lot of books that you may or may not have heard of, but the, the, of, of the more well-known uh, literature out there where um, woodlice play a part. There, there are, there's a, a, an Inspector Wexford a novel by Ruth Randall, No More Dying Please, woodlice are mentioned there. Uh, Flaubert mentions them in, in Madame Bovary. Uh, any kid who's had to read Lord of the Rings at school may have encountered uh, the woodlice that are mentioned in there. Even Jean-Paul Sartre mentions uh, woodlice uh, more than once and uh, this word clapot again uh, is, is a French word uh, used to to describe woodlice um, but the the expression that somehow translates is it was always woodlouse hot it is woodlouse hot as if woodlouse hot is an expression um, not one I know of but um, it's there in French for you and we're not going to argue with Jean-Paul Sartre are we so uh, the, another one I can't show a picture of, um, again, uh, copyright issues pro prevent me from uh, showing you a picture that's going to be up on YouTube, unfortunately. But if you have a copy of The Tales of Mrs. Tittlemouse by Beatrix Potter, um, there's a very clear image of uh, two or three obvious woodlice falling out of, of a plate rack. And, and, where, and it says there were three creepy crawly people hiding in the plate rack. And, and that's specifically what it says, creepy crawly people. And they're obviously these little gray woodlice. Um, at the time that it was published, Warns felt that the word woodlouse was deemed quite a, an offensive term. It wasn't a polite kind of thing to say, woodlouse. Um, just any kind of lice or, or louse was, was not polite. So. Beatrix Potter actually agreed to erase the offensive word woodlouse from the tales of Mrs. Uh, the tale of Mrs. Tittlemouse, and they are forever after known as creepy crawly people in, in that book. But clearly, although that's uh, a children's story, um, clearly they've, we've moved on to the point where um, children's books are full of woodlice. There are so many woodlice books out there. This is really just a sample. Um, so we clearly don't, we're not offended by, by using uh, uh, them as a character in a book anymore. And, and also a lot of these are very scientific and so very good for introducing young kids to um, a very safe, a very harmless creature. Um, that they can study and, 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 and look at. And a number of these are, have got scientific investigations within them, wild things to do with woodlice. And, um, so very popular animal with kids. The, um, I can't find you that one. And I've helped with, the, the, there is some science in, in this one by um, Sonia Copeland-Bloom, 
um, Woody the Woodlouse, who forgot how to roll into a ball, which is um, the Amateur Entomological Society uh, introduction for kids. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a lovely kid's story, um, but there is, uh, there is information um, by yours truly um, with some photographs about actual lice in the back. So there's a sort of crib note for the parents to help them answer some of the questions about wood lice. So again, if you're trying to introduce kids to wood lice, I can um, heartily recommend the Amateur Entomological Society's uh, book. <coughs> there was one small issue um, in the, the books called Woody the Woodlouse, who forgot how to roll into a ball, which seems like a nice storyline. I did have to point out that I live in Sheffield, which is landlocked and in the north of England, and around here, wood lice don't roll into a ball. Millipedes roll into a ball in Sheffield. Um, the, the common perception of uh, wood lice rolling into a ball is, is actually true if you live on the coast and if you live in the south of England, um, that they are very, very common. Um, the common armadillidium uh, vulgari, uh, the common pill bug, if, if, if you want, um, they are they are common and they're everywhere in the south and then in the coast. But if you live in the north, inland, quite a scarce thing. We do get them around. What we get around here um, are millipedes that curl into a ball, but also um, the nearest curling into a ball milli, uh, woodlouse around here is a red data book, very, very scarce species called Armadillidium pictum, which is a splendid creature, which we'll look at in detail next week. Um, but a beautiful green and, and orange and, uh, and, and almost red um, edged thing, beautiful. Anyway, so it does say at the front of the book now that it explains why the book is describing how the rice fall into a ball, because you may never have seen that happen. Um, so there we are, the complexities of children's literature. Music, um, I'll go through this. You don't need to spend a lot of time. I can't um, let you hear any of this, but do go and listen to some. It's, it's a fascinating uh, thing to go into YouTube or, or, or Spotify or whatever your um, streaming method is. And um, Alfred Tennyson and Arthur Sullivan, two very well-known um, uh, historical figures, uh, got together and wrote a song cycle called The Window. And, uh, and in there they mention, uh, you roll up away from the light, the blue woodlouse and the plump dormouse. Um, so even there we've got woodlice mentioned. There's a, there's a song by Matt Swindles called Woodlouse, um, which I, uh, often amuses me. It's a slightly tongue in cheek um, song. I hope it's supposed to be tongue in cheek. Um, what do you eat? Where do you sleep? We want to know, we want to know just like a small armadillo with six legs instead of four. You have not moved for an hour. You look so incredibly bored. Maybe you're dead. Um, interesting little song, um, quite lighthearted, I guess, but um, brings the point that quite often with a lot of uh, these um, sort of popular references to, to woodlice, um, they're seen perhaps more as an insect with six legs when actually they have 14. So not necessarily accurate taxonomically, but nonetheless um, works quite well within a song. Um, if you want more songs, uh, more music to do with woodlice, uh, there's, a, there's a range uh, to choose from there. I particularly like the one in the Slavonic Tales album here. That's quite good. It's a fairly sort of proggy jazz thing, which is quite interesting um, and, and instrumental. Um, and there's a band called The Woodlouse, We've got four albums. Um, actually, it's um, two guys largely called Liam Lever and Jake Harding um, who go under the name of the Woodlouse. Um, the Woodlouse prefers to hide under the window frame, so Liam Lever and Jake Harding and various other in helpers interpret his music as best they can. But um, interesting music is quite good. Uh, four albums of fairly largely acoustic um, music. Okay, um, more music there. So a whole host of bands that have got Woodlouse songs, Woodlouse parts one and two, the Woodlouse journey of the Woodlouse, and of course, Woodlouse acting as police, which is a, clearly a classic song. 
by John Arnaran Reigns. Um, various types of music represented by Woodlice, one way or another, from folk and jazz and piano uh, acoustic instrumentals and uh, all sorts of ambient things. But um, lots of music out there to do with Woodlice. Um, the soft jocks have even got Woodlice in the um, in the video for, for their song Woodlouse. So there are dancing Woodlice in there. So clearly um, Woodlice are very well known. Uh, in the world of science fiction, um, they crop up a lot. Um, I think this, this little armoured creature um, clearly um, sparks the imagination uh, when people are thinking about uh, warriors fighting uh, machines and what have you. So they've got these armour plated creatures, um, all sorts of humorous and, and, uh, and complicated science fiction, but um, plenty of plenty of you can find lots of science fiction wood lice. Um, but back to more um, sensible, serious, um, scientific things. I mentioned earlier that um, wood lice can be used in medicine. And when we were talking about um, them as food, as, uh, as, as, a, as a source made of wood lice, um, another useful thing is after, after your meal, um, potentially if you grind down some of the larger armadillidium species have got a lot of um, the, the calcium carbonate content in their, their body. If they're dried and then ground down, um, they make quite a good um, neutralizing. Um, it's, it's the, I, I won't use any um, <clears throat> commercial terms, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a good neutralizing uh, agent. And uh, certainly on the island in, in the Aegean seas, there are, there are islands that use Armadillidium officinalis, which is a big chunky thing. Um, so if you've got a slightly upset stomach um, and if you have no um, medication to hand, try, um, try having a chewing on a woodlouse. Um, the other thing is if you have too many of them, um, they also have a, a, a specific property um, when eating wood lice. Um, they're, they're, they act as a diuretic, um, as indicated by the French and the Dutch words for a wood louse, or at least some. There are, there are words that I don't need to interpret for you, I don't think. Um, they, they, will, they will potentially make you wet your bed if you eat. Um, wood lice and they're distinctly uh, have diuretic properties so don't overdo it with your um, with your sauce on your fried sole otherwise you may be needing the um, uh, a potty in the night a lot of people think they might be a pest as I mentioned at the beginning you see them running across a carpet like that and you see them in the house People think wood lice, pest, any kind of creepy crawly in the house, but they don't want to be there. Clearly, I've made that, made that point. But um, they also, they don't really have any um, particularly det detrimental effects anywhere. Um, they will be seen sometimes to feed on uh, young seedlings um, and the roots of, of seedlings. If, if that's where all the moisture is and there's very little else for them to feed on, Wood lice will occasionally eat your young seedlings. So can be seen gathered together, perhaps in a greenhouse underneath uh, a damp tray um, and might be uh, construed as being harmful, but actually very rarely are they causing damage. If seedlings die um, and things are unsuccessful, then the wood lice may well be straight on the scene to clear the mess up and, and eat the decaying uh, plants. So again, looks like a pest, probably isn't. They don't actually cause any significant economic damage. Um, there's no real evidence that they, they have ever done that. <clears throat> but instead they are actually really, really important um, in creating compost and fragmenting large uh, leaf litter masses and, and other plant matter into much smaller and uh, more usable um, functional um, compost. So uh, looking at the more scientific approach, that was all very nice um, to consider this sort of 
yeah, we all know about wood lice, but you know, clearly they're out there. But the science of it is a little bit that they're, they're uh, taxonomically speaking, they're an arthropod. Um, so they've got a hard outer skeleton and um, jointed limbs and you know, their classic arthropod structure. They are a crustacean, as I've mentioned. So they are in the crab, lobster, shrimp family. Um, and basically all of those have got seven pairs of legs and some kind of jointed antenna. And um, yeah, they're, they're, they're functioning on land rather than underwater. So these are the terrestrial isopoda. Isopoda actually means equal feet. So where your lobster has got some legs that are modified for swimming and clearly two very um, uh, enlarged and, and, and modified front limbs for pincer, uh, as pincers, pretty much the same throughout. Um, there are slight modifications here and there, but generally speaking, their feet are all the same. So um, wood lice are isopoda things with equal similar feet. So that's the, that's the full taxonomy of these things. They, they're a malacostracan and they sit within the, the order isopoda, but they, they sit alongside the amphipoda and the amphipoda are, are, are flattened um, from sort of side to side and the wood lice are, are flattened top to bottom. Um, the amphipods are, are the sort of uh, sand hoppers that you see springing about if you move um, seaweed on, on a beach, these little things pinging around. There is actually a single British uh, terrestrial amphipod, um, which we call the wood hopper because you turn over leaf litter in a woodland and these things ping around in the same way that they might on a beach. Um, Architellitris dorieni is the only one that, well, there, there's, there's potentially another one as well, but the main thing that we see is Architellitris. And um, as a group, BMIG kind of have taken that on board um, because it's one that we find in our terrestrial environment. So it's a sort of honorary isopod um, in, for the BMIG. But generally speaking, we're only really looking at the isopoda and specifically today and next week, the suborder on Iskidia, which are the terrestrial wood lice. There are the aquatic water lice, um, Acellus aquaticus, uh, that people might know from pond dipping, but we're just looking at the terrestrial wood lice on Iskidia. Obviously, crustaceans are largely evolutionary um, aquatic species, but in making that transition to land, wood lice have had to adapt uh, in a number of key ways. Um, and it's quite obvious when you look at them, they've got this very flat, um, stable body. And, and it's, you can see it's got like a 14 legged tripod, if there's such a thing as a 14 legged tripod, um, which is um, very stable um, for them not falling over in the same way that the amphipods, you know, are always falling onto their side. Um, so they've got walking limbs for uh, adapting to walking uh, across a, a, a dry surface or at least a, a land surface, um, not supported by moisture. So they've got a, a structure which supports the creature without the aid of water. Um, they're able to breathe air and they're able to, at various degrees, um, regulate the water uh, loss from the body and control that. Um, they're not excellent at it, but clearly they've survived many millions of years um, on the land, so they're, they're clearly not bad. Um, and one of the interesting things is that as an aquatic species, they've adapted ways to lay their eggs and give birth to their young in an aquatic environment, which um, is quite fascinating, which we'll, we'll, which we'll look at. Um, so obvious um, essentials for moving onto the land. Um, nonetheless, they are still very intolerant to water loss. I, I'm sort of suggesting they weren't great at, uh, at, at um, osmoregulation. They're okay, um, but they really aren't good enough to stay away um, very long from moist environments. So walking across your lounge carpet, it's okay for a while. But before long, you'll find dead, dehydrated 
uh, desiccated wood lice uh, rather than healthy ones. Um, so some of them, are, yeah, many of them are, are quite tied to um, moist areas. Um, so they are quite limited in their ability to conserve water. Um, and the millipedes and centipedes and woodlice have in common the fact that they, they, they don't have a waxy uh, cuticle, uh, there's like a waterproof layer that the insects have. Um, so they have to have a whole host of different mechanisms, different methods to maintain that, um, that water within their body. Um, because they, they're, not, they're not really waterproof in the same way that um, an insect is. The, there are some desert species which have developed a, a sort of waxy layer, um, but nothing in Britain. Um, so a lot of what they do is, is behavioural in order to help them to prevent dehydration. And um, these are things that you, you, you've seen, but you won't perhaps have uh, uh, appreciated in a woodlouse. But, excuse me, they... Um, if they encounter an increase in humidity, their speed and activity reduces. So that's a sort of natural response in a woodlouse. You increase its humidity and you can test this. And I mentioned earlier that there's, there's a book that has some very nice um, investigations in it along the line. So, so this book by Stephen Sutton, it's out of print now long ago, I think, but if you, if you can obtain a, a secondhand copy, it's got some nice experiments where you can, to approve these points. Um, but also if you increase the humidity, they, they turn and change direction more frequently as well. And so you can imagine if you're a woodlouse walking along in a straight line and, and you're sort of, I don't know, distressed, I need to get somewhere that I'm, I'm, I'm drying out here. Um, but if you, if you find yourself and the humidity is increasing, which is a good thing for you, then you, you tend to slow down because you don't want to rush past that point. And your activity reduces, but also if you keep changing direction, that also suggests that you're going to stay put rather than carry on past this this point of higher uh, humidity. So there are lots of interesting little um, practical um, experiments with mazes and, and and all sorts of things that you can uh, see this actually happening. Um, but great little um, animals for doing this with, and you know very easy to keep. The other thing that they're doing, um, as well as um, trying to stay somewhere humid, they're trying to avoid the light. Light is usually associated with the sun, and sun is a very drying, obviously uh, dehydrating uh, experience for them. So they're avoiding the light, so dark and humid areas. They also love to be in contact with their surroundings. These pictures show quite clearly as, as something that you've seen commonly. Um, they like to touch each other, they like to lie against each other and on top of each other, because the more they do that, the more they are sort of cooperating in the retention of um, the humidity that they've got. So that's a very good uh, communal way of retaining uh, moisture. Um, they'll also find that, that liking contact um, means that they'll go down into crevices and find themselves into holes, which is another good way to avoid uh, dehydration. Because of avoiding light, they're more active at night. Generally speaking, if you're looking for woodlice, look out, look for them at night time. Um, there's no sun, it's a damper, more humid time, it's cooler. Um, and that's particularly true with the small species because some of the very tiny ones, we're talking two, three millimeter long uh, animals and the ratio between their surface area and their body um, is, is, is enormous uh, the, it, and so they can lose moisture very quickly and the top tip and it's really essential to know is if you're, if you're looking for these tiny little things and you collect them you put them into a little pot and start watching them they will die before your eyes they were quite literally, if you've got uh, something like this one bottom right here, which is um, uh, Trichoniscus pygmaeus, it's a tiny little um, two or three millimeter long uh, woodlouse. And it, I, often you're, you're put into a pot to try and get your hand lens to it to, to have a look. And as it's walking along, its back end will start going on and uh, up and it will start to wave um, the, the, these little tails around as if it, it's struggling to maintain um, the moisture within its body and it, it's just um, drying out uh, instant, and they will 
die very quickly if you don't put something damp in there with them. Um, so always keep, especially the small ones, keep them moist. Um, so I'm just going to have a look at some of the key anatomical uh, features um, this week. Next week, we'll look at a little bit more at how some of these can be used to identify them, but just to get a sense of the general woodlouse anatomy. If you think in terms of an insect with a head and a, and a thorax and an abdomen, then it's not dissimilar in that there's a head and then a, a zone that has legs like a thorax and then a zone that has um, genitalia and, and uh, respiratory um, organs in it. And in a woodlouse, you've got the head, you've got the perion, which is this, the, the, the central um, main part of the body here from which the legs um, are formed, um, which is like the thorax in some respects. And then you've got this sort of abdominal part, um, which is called a pleon. Um, I, I can never remember. I, it's so easy to mix up perion and pleon and perionite and pleonite. And don't beat yourself up too much if you can't remember these, because you know those of us who've looked at them for years still get slightly confused. Um, but in short, you've got a head. And I just check what my next slide is. Yes. So you've got a head that has antennae. Um, and these have elbowed joints. So it's they're not just straight out, perhaps like in uh, the centipedes um, that we saw um, last time for those of you who were with us on that. So there's a, a distinct elbow to the um, and an angle to the joints on the antennae. Um, they also have the head supports underneath um, biting, chewing mouth parts. So unlike the shrimps and, and, and uh, other crustacea and, uh, that are living underwater where they're doing a, a filter feeding um, and taking uh, nutrients out of the water, these are actually crunching through materials, which is why they're very uh, important in the breakdown of um, uh, of, of plant material and leaf litter, because these are, along with the millipedes, these are coming along sort of first things to get the leaves and break them into smaller pieces that then other creatures can, can eat and, and use. Um, so they've got quite good crunching, grinding mouth parts um, on the head. So that's this top end. So then you've got the perion bit and like a thorax, the legs arise from that point. And because it's called a perion, the uh, legs are called periopods. So they're pod as in uh, leg. So they're the legs from the perion. Um, so they're periopods. And there are always seven pairs. So they're not, they're not increasing, they're not reducing. It's not like a millipedes and centipedes with the variation um, occurring. As they mature, you know, you've got seven pairs of legs and, and that's your lot. And then on the pleon at the tail end, the yellow area here, um, there are five segments. So you've got obviously seven with um, seven pairs of legs, 14 legs in total. You've then got five um, segments of the pleon. Some people would say there are six, including the telson. So there are five or six if you include the telson, uh, which is basically the pointy bit at the, the tail end of the woodlouse. And from that uh, pleon, um, the what we normally call with other, other things, tergites are called pleonites. The perionites in the perion, the pleonites on the on the pleon. So the, the shields across the back of the animal are these uh, pleonites and perionites. And underneath, um, what you can see over here on the bottom right, um, there are various structures that are probably adapted somewhere along evolutionarily um, from a uh, from a limb and. Um, so therefore, they're referred to as um, a pod, if you like. It's, it's been achieved by the modification of a limb. And these are pleopods, but they're not a walking limb as, as you would have with the periopod. These are 
pleopods which have been formed into one sort of structure or another, which may be used for reproduction um, or osmoregulation or the absorption of gases. Um, and so for now, I'm using the term like they're a gill. So they might be forming a gill for breathing for a reproductive organ, but um, they're not really gills. So that's the basic format that you've got. So you start with the head, you've got the perion, you've got the pleon, you've got a little telson sticking out. And then either side of that, there are these uropods, um, which um, stick out at the back end, which we'll, we'll look at in a second. So the, these pleopods, is, is the, they're useful for identification, depending on how many of these little white patches you can see. Um, the pleopods function largely in the control of water, um, but also in the uptake of oxygen. Um, the way that they uh, actually um, take oxygen out of the air is more akin to a lung than it is to a gill. Um, so they are referred to, um, so these white patches are actually referred to as pleopodal lungs. So it's like a, a, a lung on the pleopods. And, and some of the more terrestrial species, um, these, are, these are quite highly developed, um, which is, is a, a good um, a structural um, uh, adaptation that allows them to, to live on the land. Um, but you can see them in the large, larger species. You've got these patches, there are sort of five on there and two each on the sides here. Um, I say that they, they actually exchange, the gases are actually directly exchanged with the, the sort of um, blood system um, within the animal uh, in the same way that we, our lungs work. Um, the males, these, these are both female, but if, uh, if these were male, they would also have some structures down the center here that would be quite obvious, which they used um, as a copulatory organ, which we'll, we'll see uh, in a moment. So the, the right at the rear end, these two bits that stick out either side of the telson, they're called uropods. Um, a variety of um, things that they're used for, um, it's not always entirely uh, clear, but there are definitely some repellent um, and sensory functions, but I, I probably more often than not observe them in some kind of water management um, uh, situation. Um, and say when, when you've got one that looks like it's dehydrating and dying, these, these uropods are often um, very active as if they're seeking out moisture or helping them to um, detect and sense moisture. Um, but, but a number of functions to that, but a useful character when it comes to identifying wood lice. When they, um, when they mate, um, they actually um, basically climb on top as this image shows at the bottom. Um, this is that really pretty Armadillidium pictum, which I mentioned that, you know, in, in Derbyshire uh, dales. This is the species we see that does actually curl into a ball around here, and a very special beast it is too. Um, the male and female generally look exactly the same. It's very hard to tell a male from a female woodlouse without turning up, upside down to have a look at the pleopods um, at the hind end. And they are usually pretty straightforward. Well, it, it, they're small, but they are diagnostic, so a very good character for identifying um, what species you're dealing with. Um, and so the male climbs on and, they, and it'll, it'll stimulate the female by drumming on her back with his front legs. And, and these, the back end, possibly the last pair of legs have got certain other characteristic um, structures, so they're not absolutely equal feet. They've got some structures which may help him to hang on or to um, help him possibly insert um, these various parts into the female. Um, but there's not a lot of modification, but there again, there are some modifications there which will help in the identification of species. But basically he climbs on, holds on, drums, and then transfers sperm um, by inserting the longer of these two uh, endopods into her genital opening underneath and that's how uh, it fertilizes the female. Um, yeah, well, and I think there may be, well, there's plenty of pictures of those next week that we'll see because 
it's a, it's a useful identification characteristic. Um, in terms of their life history, once they've, so they've mated, they've climbed on, is fertilized female, um, they, lay, they lay eggs. And I mentioned that they need to lay them underwater. Um, effectively, um, at, still at this point, a little bit like frogs returning to a pond, still got that, that ancient element of aquatic um, reproduction going on. So how do, how do woodlice do it? Do they, do they return to a pond? Kind of, but they carry the pond with them. So they have a, a brood pouch between their front legs, um, which you can see here, there's like a membrane between the legs and that is fluid filled. And here you can see that they've then developed um, into young woodlice as they've, they've hatched. So the eggs are laid inside this brood pouch, this marsupium, so it's like a pouch, like a kangaroo, like a marsupial. So it's a pouch um, which is full of liquid. The eggs are laid in there, they hatch, and then they um, burst forth into the terrestrial environment as a very small and perfectly formed little woodlouse called a manka. Um, so they come out of a marsupium as a manka and then shed their skins and start to grow and shed the skin, shed their skin and, and uh, mature um, over the coming months. Um, the great thing about woodlice is, although they're very small, there are a lot of the characteristics that you're looking for to identify them that, are, that can be seen in, even in these little mankas. Um, so um, even the very smallest one, if you've, if you've got pitfall samples in which you get all sorts of ages of, uh, of woodlouse, you can often still identify um, at least to a, to a genus, um, uh, if not species, quite often um, from very, very young individuals. So that, that, that's a, it's a great bonus with, with woodlice. <clears throat> um, they'd mature within a year, um, largely, and then probably live for um, two to four years, perhaps five years in captivity. Um, but this molting process is fascinating as they, they, they molt because they've got to shed this hard exoskeleton. Um, they do it half the time so that they're not totally vulnerable at one point. And the rear half that you can see here um, sort of becomes a little bit cloudy and then that, that shed off um, as this thing at the bottom here shows. And, and then the front half as you can see in this one. So this one shed its, its rear half and that's all good as new. And then the front half gets this sort of glazed uh, appearance and off and out, well, out it steps from the front end this time, leaving an immaculate, beautiful little um, replica of the woodlouse that was there before. So you see these little half woodlice around. Um, they're just the shed skins, but it's a very useful technique to maintain your, uh, your ability to still escape um, and function. Um, so they just do it half the time, which is just brilliant. And look out for that, fascinating. If you see some that are half um, shared like that, it's worth perhaps taking them, keeping them in a moist environment and you can observe this whole process happen. Quite, quite fascinating beasts. So they like to be moist. So where do you find them? You find them uh, in the ground layer. They are in leaf litter, they're under rocks, they're in among grass, they're, they're in the damp places where there is decaying vegetation for them to feed on. So they're living within their meal, they're living within their habitat, which is keeping them moist. Um, and also on the seashore. So there are littoral species and, and species which live um, perhaps in the splash zone uh, of the coast. And there are a number of species I don't see in Sheffield because I don't live on the coast. Um, and so if you live on in, in coastal areas, there'd be a number of different species to look out for um, than, than other people inland may see. Um, I've mentioned um, enough times already that they will be seen walking across a carpet. It's a hostile environment for them. They don't want to be there. They want to be in damp moist environment where there's food to eat. They're basically vegetarian. Their diet is almost entirely vegetarian. They like to eat dead plant matter. I mentioned that they might eat seedlings if that's what's available to them. 
Um, but they will occasionally scavenge on animal remains. Um, so if there's a, a dead mouse or something, then they're not averse to eating a bit of rotting mouse in the same way that they'll eat a bit of rotting wood. Um, it's used to good effect. Um, it's used to good effect in museums um, or if, if you're someone who wants to clean up a skeleton, I think this, I mentioned this in a moment, but um, they will clean skeletons. And, and it's, although people use something like museum beetles to clean skeletons, the last thing you want in a museum are museum beetles. So a tank full of wood lice will clean a skeleton for you if you've got delicate bones that you're trying to um, clean the flesh from. Uh, coprophagy is a really important concept with wood lice. Um, it means that they eat their poo. Um, and coprolites are fossilized poo. Coprophagy um, is eating your poo. And um, I'll just go back. The, it's essential that they are given the opportunity to eat their own droppings. It's a way of recycling some of the minerals that they lose. Um, nothing to do with coprophagy, but copper in particular is one of the minerals that they don't want to lose. And so by eating, again, their own droppings, they can uh, recapture some of the lost uh, useful minerals. Um, obviously, they don't eat it all again, but they, they'll eat some. And uh, it's shown that in, in captivity, if you prevent them, if you're too fastidious and clean and keep cleaning it, it's really not good for them at all. Um, you've got to let them eat their, their own droppings. Um, so that, that's an essential if you're, if you're keeping them as pets. And um, so anywhere that if you're in, a, in a compost heap or in a woodland, they're essential to breaking down, chewing through. Um, but because of this process of chewing and rechewing their, their, their droppings and what comes out the other end is very rich. Uh, these, the, the, the droppings are uh, much easier for then other species to break down and continue that whole uh, decomposition process. So they're really uh, important in that respect. They're also mentioned a very good um, food source for lots of things from beetles and toads and birds and spiders. Um, specifically, there's, um, there's a genus of spider called Dystera, and uh, this is Dystera crocata, and they have enormous fangs at the front end and they exclusively feed on wood lice. They're designed to be able to get around and um, tip these things up and pierce into the soft underbellies of, of wood lice and then suck them dry. Um, but so they, they only eat wood lice pretty much. Um, and of wood lice that are eaten, 40% of them are eaten by centipedes. So um, the centipedes that we've talked about previously um, are, are really quite a predator of wood lice. So without, without the um, wood lice, you're not really gonna get your centipedes. So they'll have to find other food sources. Um, so yeah, it's a, a keen predator. But there's also there's also a parasitic fly family, the Rhinophoridae, um, the woodlouse flies, that specifically um, parasitize wood lice. And in the recent BMIG newsletter, there was an appeal, uh, I think by Ryan Mitchell, who um, is involved with the recording scheme. So I'll plug it here. Um, if anyone finds a fly emerging from um, wood lice that they're keeping in captivity. Um, the, uh, the rhinophorid recording scheme would be really interested um, to receive your records. And what they do is they lay their eggs on that, on that tail end, on those two uropods, and they wait till that hind end of the woodlouse is being discarded as it sheds its skin. And while it's vulnerable at that point and it's soft, the, uh, the larvae emerge, um, hatch and um, dig in, in between the plates of the woodlouse. They then grow within the woodlouse and form a pupa as can be seen there. And then out of the dead woodlouse, you get your um, Trachogena rubicosa or whatever your rhinophorid is. So uh, really interesting, presumably very under recorded, um, but the associations between which wood lice they were um, parasitizing would be of great interest to the recording scheme. So there we go. So here we are in wood lice, 
Uh, in, in captivity, very easy. It's obvious. Keep it damp. Put in a bit of damp moss and decaying fruit and veg, potato peelings, a bit of cuttlefish bone for calcium, something like that, or, or, or something which will is calcium rich so that they can uh, absorb that and, and create their um, their own exoskeleton. And as I mentioned, you know, they will eat flesh and will, you know, you drop in a, 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 a something with a bone, they will probably clean the bone for you. Um, so based on what we know as to where what they like to live, where they like to live, if you're looking to collect them, look under stones, look in the in um, leaf litter, more active at night. So take a torch out, look at walls as they're running around, but they are slightly faster and harder to catch. It's also dark and more difficult to see them. They're very tolerant of cold and it's worth going out on frosty days when it's extremely frosty because there are certain species some of the very small ones that seem to really respond um, well, are much easier to find. Perhaps they're avoiding burying down, I don't know. But frosty days are very good for finding um, some of the rarer species. Just pick them up, hand searching as, as I'm doing there with a the trowel. Sieving is great. Putting down pitfall traps so that they fall into that or using Torgren funnels. Uh, Torgren funnel is basically a, uh, an upturned something or other, um, like in this case, plant pots with a light in it and uh, over a funnel and they will avoid the light. You put the leaf litter in the funnel and they'll drop down through. You can use possibly a vacuum sampler that works. I've collected wood lice in, through vacuum sampling. Sieves of various different gauges and pitfall traps, basically anything that allows the thing to fall into the ground, um, into a pot, cover it with a uh, a shrew cover if you don't want to be catching larger mammals and other things. Uh, the thing in the bottom there is a subterranean pitfall trap so you can actually sink pitfall traps down into the soil and uh, and get different species because they're much further down. Uh, someone asked last time about centipedes, this is my sieve system, I use um, uh, bonsai tree um, soil sieving sieve so you get three different gauges of sieve here that fits into there and uh, it took me years to realize that a square tray is not as sensible as a nice round tray underneath um, you just place it underneath shake your sieves and from your leaf litter form your various wood lice so just pick them up by hand um, paintbrush a wetted paintbrush picks them up um, or some stalk, soft stalk spill forceps Drop them straight into alcohol, 70 to 80% uh, denatured alcohol or industrial methylated spirit, ethyl alcohol. Um, a little bit of glycerine helps um, if they dry out, then they don't get too brittle. It um, keeps them so supple. If you want to do DNA sampling or somebody's going to look at them later on, um, you can use um, up to um, absolute ethanol is ideal. Uh, or you can buy bioethanol um, from camping shops. Um, and if you are collecting and dropping things straight into alcohol to take away to look at later, um, make a note of any eye colour because it fades. You'll lose the crit some critical colour features in alcohol. Pop them in a tube. I'm sure most of you don't want to teach you how to suck eggs and stuff that you're very familiar with, but you can then, having put, popped them in there, it kills them as humanely as, as you can hope for. Um, they then can be preserved in the same place. Drop in a label with waterproof ink saying where you found it, preferably some kind of grid reference, when you found it, who you are, and if you know what it is, a separate label with the identification and your name as to what species it is. Um, that's my collection and the museum, um, um, one of them. Um, voucher specimens are really important. Taking specimens, there's a whole subject we could talk about there, but basically you can go back to it. So 50 years time when they've decided that there are, uh, it, the species has been split into three or there's a new DNA technique that, that can be used. As, as knowledge increases, you can go back and you can refer to these things. You can also then use them as a reference collection and compare one that you've identified with another. Um, and males are more useful to collect. 
if, if at all possible, collect a male because they have these genitalia structures which are diagnostic. Recording them, we use in this country iRecord, which is just, it, it, it's, it's, there's a verifier for wood lice who's uh, very efficient, Steve Gregory, who will um, look at your record and, and verify uh, or not, depending on what, what you've said. Um, and that will go straight into the recording system. So do use iRecord. Um, you can get the data back, shows you where you've been recording, shows you oops, all my movements uh, in, over the last couple of years. And there is a, a, a reasonably good app on, for phones as well. So that, that, that I use that all the time for recording my wood lice, as you can see. So I recommend the iRecord app for your phone. So next time we'll look at, so sorry if you're disappointed, you wanted to learn how to identify common species, but um, next time we will look at a whole range of species in some detail, so you will be able to identify a lot of the British ones. So we'll be looking at patterns and colours and shapes and what have you to try and identify these things and look at what the key characters are. That on the 1st of April, same time next week, um, some of those marvellous creatures that you can see there, they're all these fantastically varied things. We'll have a look at those and you'll be able to identify those. In I'll, I'll, you can look at these in detail when it's on Facebook. I'm not going to go, and um, sorry, on YouTube. The details are here are some of the key references that, you, that I've mentioned. So um, Steve's Atlas book, um, the, the ID guide, the aid gap key, the sort of key work by Oliver and Meachin, a nice field guide. Um, and my uh, original guide to the Sheffield area with it as a local, an example of local maps is now available for free uh, as, a down, uh, as a PDF on Sorby Natural History Society's website at that link. And if you're lucky enough to be able to get a copy of the, um, the old Woodlouse book by Steve Sutton, you can do those little investigations. Beyond that, um, again, BMIG, it's free. All of these are now free online. The, the bulletin and the newsletter of the Myriapod group, that's where you find out about the new species and the sort of new science, the identification characters of anything new and uh, uh, interesting uh, arriving in the country. So it's all on the website. My website, uh, my Flickr page is there for some pretty pictures. And that, as they say, is that, I'm sorry, it went on that little bit longer because of the technical difficulties, but I'm, I'm still prepared to answer questions if you wish to ask any. Thank you. Are you all out there? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much um, in, indeed, Paul. That was, that was a really fascinating introduction. And, and it's, so, it's so nice to be able to... Um, listen to a, a, a really proper comprehensive introduction and not just, you know, completely about ID, which <laughs> so many times is you're, you're so limit, you know, it can be, things can be limited to that. Um, it's really nice to go over the different aspects of, of how they're associated with, with people and, and really, really doing it properly. And, you know, which will, I'm sure, whet people's appetite for, for next week they can really get into to the identification. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that that bit, the, the sort of introduction, is often with, with any of these talks, there are always people that, you know, only really want the detail of, um, you know, how to identify stuff. But I, I, I thought it's, it's there's so much information about woodlice. It's nice that those people who are absolutely new to it and just want some general information, that's what you got tonight. So... Um, if it, if it was a bit if it was a bit old hat for some of you, I apologise, but I'm sure that there are a lot of people out there that uh, hopefully it will have spurred you on to come next week and learn about counting hairs and looking at genitalia. No, I'm I'm sure it would have done. That was excellent. We'll we'll go we'll go straight into to questions then, um, if that, that's all right. Mm -hmm. um, so we had the first one from Ben Hargreaves. Um, do the very large wood lice that occur at the coast, I see slaters, I've heard them called, class as intertidal isopods? Um, it's an interesting one, which I will touch on next time. They are, they're looking at removing them. They, 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 the, um, those sea slaters 
are so different um, that they are, yeah, there's, there's some taxonomic shift taking place. Um, between now and next week, I will see where the current state of play is. But on the Facebook group recently, that has been raised and, and there, is, there is this definite, a definite move to include them more in the intertidals than as, as a terrestrial isopod. Um, but, you know, to me, they're always going to be a terrestrial isopod, but, um, but yeah, they, they, they're, they're closer, closer to one of these in many respects. Oh. I don't mean a furry toy. <laughs> But, so yeah, I'm not going to definitive answer because I'm not quite sure where it stands, but it has been a recent discussion and that's where taxonomy is going at the moment to remove them from the Honiskidia um, and, and place them somewhere else. Yeah, I'm, I'm always I'm always really impressed when I see a Lydia on, on, oh, on yeah. the coast. They are Fantastic. quite or something, aren't they? The, the reddish coloured ones are particularly, I mean, they're not all dark grey boring slaty colored things they there's some really nice uh they just sort of ones. feel prehistoric there's something mm. sort of uh very ancient about them really. yeah um okay a question from um heather sheely which species roll up the there are a number of species that roll up um next week i've got a nice slide which shows you uh, the nice thing about uh it, when you when you're new to Woodlice is that if you find ones that roll up, some of them can be identified by how well they roll up as well, because some leave a little gap, some leave their antennae sticking out. So the way that they roll up can be different as well. But generally speaking, the, the obvious one is the armadillidium species, as in armadillo, which is you know, obviously an animal which rolls up into a ball, um, a much, much larger beast. Um, but there are others, Silisticus, and um, that there, there are we'll look at some of those next week in fact i think i've got we'll go through all of the armadillidium species to separate them um but yeah the big chunky ones that roll into a ball and um, that there, there are there are there are a few species um but yeah all covered next week i shouldn't be saying oh you must come back this week you can't just do one but um yeah that there are mostly armadillidium species and some of those are the prettiest some of the prettiest woodlice we've got they're not just slate gray okay uh, a, a question from eric oshel what resources do you have for bringing woodlice into a science classroom for study um in terms of um suggestions for for identifying or, or, or more information that's available if you haven't got that book um i guess that's what the question is i'm not sure but um i say if you can get hold of a copy of that and that, it's it's scarce um there is a there is a version of it which is just the key um the central part and and, and you know i've got three copies of that if you only were if you're only in the room with me i could give you a copy but the this this does include a, a variety of um techniques I, online there are a lot of little experiments you can do with woodlice in terms of how, how to do it it's just a matter of having a tub wet tissue at the bottom or in some cases um plaster of paris if you if you uh, make plaster of paris at the bottom of a, of a dish that's a very good way you just pour water onto it it absorbs moisture and that's that's a good way of keeping a nice clean culture and and it's and it's moist um but then just moist materials in there bit, and soil you have to have a lot of soil i think a mistake a lot of people make is put loads of soil in there and that's 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 almost a byproduct of what they want they the leaf litter is, is is more preferable um magnifying lenses and things to have a, a closer look with magnifying glass things so you can actually see what what's going on in there but in terms of that some of those children's books, if you go back to that slide when you can, um, a couple of those books were specifically um, suggesting little experiments that you can do. Um, but making making mazes is great. I remember even at university, I did a we had to do a thing where there was a bifurcating um, maze and it went up and left and right and then up and left and right and up and left and right. And statistically if a woodlouse turns right the first time it will turn left the next time and then next time it gets to a junction it will turn right again 
statistically. I mean, it's, they don't always, they don't go right, left, right, left, but there are lots of little experiments you could do like that. I can't point to any specific website, I'm afraid. I don't think there's anything even on the BMIG website about that, but um, some of those books that were listed definitely do have school projects in them. If that's sufficient. You can all write to me and I'll see if I can find you something, but I think you'll probably find it quicker than me by just searching the internet. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really comprehensive answer, Paul. Okay, a question from Caitlin Bennett. Where can I get one of those plush giant isopods? <laughs> because I need that in my life. Yeah, we all need that in our life. Um, Japan, um, I think is the easy answer. Um, I think I got it as a gift. You know, people know what I love. Um, some friends bought it me for my birthday and it came from Japan um, direct. I think it was on eBay. It's a marine isopod. Uh, it's got the wrong bits at the end here for a terrestrial isopod, but it's got the right number of legs and it's got compound eyes. It says it's, it's, it's almost Lygia and it's almost a woodlouse, but it is life size. There are marine isopods that are that size, um, which is fascinating. Um, I, I didn't show it because of copyright issues, but if you search marine isopods on YouTube, um, there are there are some of these huge big things scuttling around in the seabed, which are fascinating. I don't know if they're still there. They used to have some in the deep, in Hull, um, so big wood lice. And there are also some fascinating marine wood lice, which replace the tongue of a fish. They eat the fish's tongue and then they functionally replace it by sitting there and they pick up food as the fish eats it. And occasionally you, you find them in, um, in, in uh, markets, fish markets in, in this country. You might open a red snapper's mouth and there might be this marine isopod which is sitting there as if it's the tongue of the fish. So <laughs> fun stuff out there if you're into marine isopods excellent i'll take a, a, a question from the from the floor now would anyone is, i don't see anyone's um hand up or virtual hand up at the moment but if if, if someone would like to there, there you go sophia. sophia would you like to unmute yourself um yeah i was going to ask um, do we know much about how wood lice will respond to climate change and if there are any species that are threatened? Um, that's a very good question. I like that. Um, in terms of threatened, I mean, I, my experience is British, um, British wood lice. And we have, we have rare species. We have species which are on our red data list because they are so scarce and their habitats are very um, specific and so that there, there are scarce species which are therefore threatened anyway just by the fact that so few of them any damage to that habitat will threaten them so that's that's a weak answer from me but so there are those in terms of climate change where climate change is going to impact a woodlouse, and I'm making this up as I go along um, as an answer, but obviously the key elements of climate change is either going to get drier or it's going to get wetter. Um, that's, that's the big deal for a wood, from a woodlouse's point of view. So if you're in the sort of part of the world where at a key point in its life history, it's getting too dry, then yes, it's going to impact those species and undoubtedly. If it's a key point in its um, life history where it gets flooded, then you know there's a limit to how much. Some of, some of them are very tolerant. You know, wood lice will survive underwater. That's that's not such a problem. But you know, if you've got major um, flood um, incidents taking place on a regular basis, you are changing that habitat beyond what that wood louse wants. On the other hand, we will then find, I, I suspect, we'll see there's a species, uh, Trichelipus rathkii, which we'll look at next week. Um, find it in very damp places, find it on the side of rivers in sort of floodplains, so it likes it wet. So it could well be that, and that's quite scarce, we, we don't see that very often at all. Um, but, you know, more floods, maybe that's the thing that's going to tolerate it. Uh, some of these tiny little things 
um, almost certainly they did just disappear down into the soil. Um, so floods not necessarily going to be uh, that much of an issue, but it might be helpful to expand the range of other species. So, I mean, that's a, that's a vague answer, but you know, the obvious is that if it's too dry, they won't like it and they will die out. If it's too wet, some may like it, others will die out. But it's going to, it's, as, every, as ever with climate change, it's going to be so unpredictable as to what's happening and what the response is from these species. Um, they're not going to, sadly, they're not going to be capable of reverting back to an aquatic animal entirely. Um, perhaps they'll all turn into, they'll, they'll all start to produce these um, kind of gills at the, at the back end and just go for a swim. But um, no, they, they, they'll survive underwater, but they won't survive extended desiccation. They will, they will bury themselves into the soil. Some may tolerate that, some of them, some of them won't. Um, the big things do, the big armadillidium, they're very good at tolerating dry, hence the fact they find them on sand dunes and, and, and all sorts of urban areas. Um, and they may well be the things that survive at the end of the day when we're all dead. There'll be these big curling wood lice that, that live on. I hope that's vaguely close to what you wanted to know. It's as good as, uh, I mean, yeah, climate change is so complicated that uh, the answer to every climate change question is it's complicated but yeah thank you i can't i can't basically quote a lovely paper that you can go to where someone has observed um wood lice but the thing the thing with a lot of these things with, with a lot of these micro sort of animals um the, the, they're not being that impacted at a, at a gross scale you can chop down the, the forest but if the leaf litter is still there they might not notice for you know many years it's, it, it's, their habitat is largely unchanged. Um, all they need is for somebody to come along and replace the leaf litter or fly tip or throw a compost heap and build a compost heap there. And they'll find, they won't notice that the woodland has gone. So it, they don't have these the gross impacts that you would something that's relying on a stand of trees or, um, you know, or, or doesn't want a desert to appear in well. These things don't want a desert either. But anyway, yeah, it's, they, they, they'll survive in their little pockets of, of habitat. Okay, thanks. We'll, um, we'll go on to the next question. Uh, for, this is from Charlotte. What's with the cheese reference? Do you know? Smell of cheese? Question mark. Yeah, cheesy pigs and cheese logs. I, I don't, I don't honestly know. I mean, I, I couldn't possibly help, help you with where these names derive. Um, the piggy things, I suppose, maybe it's like a snuffling little um, small mini pig or something like that. Um, heaven knows what Gramazow means. I don't live in Cornwall. Um, but um, yeah, cheese, I'm not sure. Cheesy logs, no idea. Uh, anybody who happens to be in the right part of the country where that's what they're called, I mean, Granny Gamfer and Granny um, Granny something or other that, that I've, I've heard people specifically say to me, and it's just just a, I think it's like an affectionate term in those cases, just a familiar thing, or it's you know it's something that reminds you of your childhood in the same way that your grandmother does or whatever. There's some very nice cozy kind of familiarity names. Cheese, I don't know. I have no idea where cheese comes from. <laughs> Okay, uh, a question from Elaine Richardson. How often do they shed their skin, please? Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think next week I may mention that. I think it's in a slide. Um, so I've read that recently. Um, they shed them, uh, I think, something like eight times in their first year. But I, I, up to adult, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, it's not, it's not, um, as with a lot of these things, it's more frequent early on. So it'll almost immediately as a manker, um, it will, it will shed its skin very quickly and grow quite quickly. Um, as they get bigger, they do it less frequently, um, up to a sort of maximum. And, uh, 
it's not as complicated as with millipedes where they become mature, then they shed and become immature and then they become mature again. Um, and I guess it depends on how old they are, but it's every couple of weeks um, in, when they're younger and then less, than, less so when they're older. But I, I'm open to someone telling me there's giving a more accurate answer than that. But again, by next week, um, I might give you a more accurate answer. It's frequently, but not, not forever. Okay, a question from Florian. Can they be cannibalistic and eat their friends, same species or different species? Um, they will, as far as I understand, yes. Um, if, if there's a decaying woodlouse, then um, I, I, I believe they do um, eat woodlice. It's not, I mean, obviously what they're after is not another woodlouse, but um, that's a source of, it's a source of calcium and uh, they, they will feed on leaf litter while they can, they will feed on wood while they can. Um, if they are in need of um, calcium, they will feed on, they, they will take on board um, a dead colleague, um, but they don't, they don't go out of there. They don't, as far as I'm aware, I do not believe that they chew on other living woodlice. Okay. Um, question from Rod Hill. Um, I noticed Dystera, as in as in the woodlice predators, spiders, mm -hmm. living with woodlice. Do they use chemical subterfuge? I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. Um, I think it's just basically the spiders just sitting there among a feast, as far as I'm aware. Um, the, I don't, I'm not entirely sure. I never see it. It's not a species you get up here at all. Um, I don't know. I have no records of Dizdra, so it's not a, it's not a spider that, um, I'm very familiar with, but when I do see it, um, I'm not big on spiders and it's a horrifying looking beast. Um, there are, the thing with Dizdra is they are, there are specific species for specific types of woodlouse because the shape of their um fangs uh, are different um and they have completely different mechanisms for flipping uh and feeding on different types so so a different distro has a different method um and some will sort of approach and grab the thing and and just devour it others will turn them on the side and um so there are of the few distro um species they have a a unique way of tackling it but I think it's a bit like centipede. You turn over a stone and there'll be centipedes sitting with wood lice and, they'll, and other th things which are effectively predatory on them. And, you know, there's not much choice for a wood louse. They can't really run away and go somewhere else. They are, they're a bit stupid, let's be honest. They, they are very basic um, sensory responses, which is why they're great to do these little investigations with, and they will turn right if they've just turned left. They're not, there's not much more going into it. Again, I, I, I don't know the details of um, uh, sort of the predator prey, any, any sort of interactions that they might have, and if there are chemicals that they produce. Um, I'm ignorant of it, I'm afraid, but um, I, I'm not surprised that I see them together because, you know, say centipedes, are with woodlice all the time. I mean, if you're big, if you're big enough, the spider's not going to bother you. Um, and if you're big enough, the, the centipede won't bother you either. They'll only feed on smaller ones than themselves. Okay, Rod, did you have any comments on that yourself? Um, no, it's, I mean, lots of... Um invertebrates use chemical subterfuge to gain access to their hosts. So I just wondered, did you just see him sat above underneath the stone? Did you see him sat above with all the wood lice running around? Is this, there's nothing, no problem. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but uh, as Paul says, it's, it's, 
it's probably they are that stupid. <laughs> yeah. And, and and in fairness, the spider has sought them out. The spider has located them, um, and and is living there specifically because dinner is served. Mm -hmm. And um, you know the woodlice can wander off. They are still absolutely driven by how moist is it and how much food there is. Above, we've got to run away from. It's not like it's got to run away from a lion and go somewhere else. It, it's it's kind of stuck with where it is in order to survive at all and i guess it's like almost shoaling fish you know one of us is going to get eaten it's yeah. probably not going to be me today yeah. drawing straws for who's the unlucky yeah one as he rolled around yeah yeah and i guess the the sick and dying ones are the ones that um will probably be picked on first anyway okay, so right. stay healthy and eat you know, you're better to stay moist, you're better to eat, to keep healthy. And, you know, and they do put up a fight. You know, I've, I've seen them, you know, they, they don't always catch, the, you know, the woodlouse. They, they, they can escape a bit, but, you know, a persistent spider will, a woodlouse is not going to outrun it. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll um, we'll take a, another question from the from the floor. If anyone's anyone's got one, um, okay, we'll take one from uh, Cough Nod Richard. If you, yeah, hi Paul. Uh, yeah. I've, no I've noticed that some of the continental European woodlice are getting quite popular as pet subjects now in UK. Mm. You can buy them readily on eBay, non-native species. I guess this is going to see the UK fauna skyrocket, is it, at some point? Or, or are they just Mediterranean things that are unlikely to establish in UK when people clean out their tanks? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm sure there will be some things introduced. Um, I used to maintain a, a little colony... Um, of a Spanish one in, in the university. And you think, well, why on earth? <laughs> you know, we can do woodlice, we don't need to import them from Spain. Um, but quite often, the ones I've seen that are, are often for sale are, are sort of albino, white, you know, or slightly attractively colored variants. And um, just because they're a bit prettier. Um, but, but also they use them for like tank cleaning, um, don't they as well you sort of introduce these things to keep your vivarium clean i'm not sure why on earth you would need to import one uh, i really don't because we we have we have the equivalents here and in fact a lot of the white ones that we, we had some as well at the university which were purchased for that same purpose of, of cleaning um out vivariums and it was a British species, quite a scarce one. Um, it was um, Brachilia levis, which I've only ever seen once in the wild. But these were like white ones of that, um, quite um, interestingly coloured, um, various colours, but mostly pale. Um, so I don't know why on earth, you know, you would import a British species. Uh, um, and as I say, levis is quite a scarce thing, and it's really not, not many sites for it at all. And it's only very in certain southern locations. Um, so if people start finding pale versions of that in the north, yeah, possibly it's it, it's escaped. And and maybe these white ones will revert back to being um, the natural colour before long. But no, it's the same with any of these, any anything you can buy online. I don't doubt we'll start seeing. Certainly the ones that are not from tropical locations that will survive. And we don't find big millipedes in the countryside because they don't, they don't make it. But going back to perhaps the question about climate change, it may be that in southern parts of England, we may find things that have been that escapees, which have, are now finding they can survive in the south of England when they used to be a Spanish species. So, yeah, I... I yeah, it, it, it's an interesting thing that they, you can buy them and yeah, I expect we'll see them before long. But uh, so I did, the, 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 a lot of the excitement in looking for woodlice these days, let's be honest, is 
quite like going in a heated greenhouse. You know, the Eden Project, some of the, some of the new species discoveries in recent years in Britain, a lot of them have been in heated greenhouses and butterfly houses and what have you. And, and it's quite exciting to find something new. So those things have been dropped here, um, but it's whether things will survive in the wild. I don't know, but yeah, I think you're right. There will be some. Um, I'll make IDs a bit more complicated in the future. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always, it always adds to the fun, doesn't it? It's true. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Um, and, and Caitlin Bennett has just commented in the, in the chat, the um, importation of wood lice is primarily to avoid parasites and bacteria. Mm -hmm. They come from specifically bred colonies rather than yeah. wild capture. Yeah. Hence the fact that a lot of them are these sort of albino or, you know, very specific appearance that some of them have. So they're not, they don't look like the wild population. They're these captive bred, you know, they're, they're, they're not exactly um clean i suspect but, the, but they are um yeah they're, they're bred specifically to tidy up your um the decay in your vivariums um okay so we'll go to a, a question from kate uh what size holes do you have on your smallest sieve <laughs> uh, <laughs> um <laughs> I can't remember what it what, what the smallest size is. It's about two millimeters. I think it's it's something like two, four, and six. My the sieves that I've got. Um, you can so, measure it for next week, Paul. Yeah, I could do, couldn't I? <laughs> I can't promise I will, but um, um, yeah, they, it. It, 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 it's about it's about two millimeters, possibly three, but it's for, it, I don't I rarely use it. I use it for pseudoscorpions, um, but it's a bit small, really. Um, I tend to, yeah, I tend to use the top two. And actually, I've got a bigger one, which is like a ten millimeter one, which is just simply a garden sieve, one of these plastic buckets with a, a sieve in the bottom. Um, but yeah, I can't remember. It's, it's it's a few years since I bought it. Okay, well, there's, there's nothing more coming through in the chat, and I can't see any hands up. Um, so I, yeah, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. But um, yeah, I think that really uh, was brilliant and really sets sets us up for the next week. It's really getting into getting into ID. Um,